are continuing our, our journey through the Bible. And in recent days, our Bible reading, in our reading, we've seen God make a series of promises to an old man named Abraham. And we've seen some of those promises fulfilled. Among them, a son born to two really, really old people. Older than me, and I'm too old already. I don't want to go there. You know, uh, If Coco should tell me we're expecting a baby, I would seriously consider suicide. <laughs> I'd really have to pray through on that one. Uh, but in our reading these past days, we've seen a grandson named Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery and taken to Africa where he ends up in prison, falsely accused of the attempted rape of the lady of the house. In prison, he impresses other prisoners with his ability to interpret dreams. And one day, he is called before the emperor, the pharaoh, to demonstrate his gifts. Before the evening is over, the Hebrew prisoner, Hebrew slave prisoner, becomes the prime minister of the empire, the most powerful nation in the world of his time, the nation of Egypt. In that position, he becomes an instrument of salvation for God's people when his father Jacob escapes a famine by seeking refuge, by seeking shelter with his son Joseph in Egypt. Earlier in Genesis, we saw how God had told Abraham that his descendants would spend 400 years in Egypt. They would suffer abuse at the hands of the Egyptians. And that promise we see now in our reading has been fulfilled. And that brings us to where we began reading, where we began reading yesterday, the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. Now, let me just insert this here. If you haven't been reading with us and want to join, don't try to go back and catch up. Leave that, pick that up as you can and add that to it just to bring it up. But start reading with us today in Exodus 3. And keep going forward three chapters a day. And follow the blog. Now, so the second book of Bible, the book of Exodus, which we will be reading now over the next 11 days. The name Exodus is based on the fact that it chronicles the deliverance of the Hebrew people from their captivity in Egypt. But it's much more than the story of deliverance. In fact, there are actually five things, five major features to Exodus that I would like you to be aware of as you read. One, the book of Exodus records the historical circumstance of Israel's birth as a nation. Two, it does contain the Ten Commandments. That's in chapter 20, which was God's summary of his own moral law and his requirements for his people, which provided a foundation for biblical ethics and morals. That became the foundation of what we know today as the Judeo-Christian ethic, which thousands of years later would give rise to something we, we call English common law which gave rise to the Constitution and the laws of the United Republic of Tanzania. And it all grew from there. It presents God's redemptive grace and power in action by vividly telling the story of God's deliverance of his people from the peril and bondage of sin, Satan, and the world. The entirety of Exodus is drenched with a majestic revelation of God's character as we see him as truthful, merciful, faithful, holy, and omnipotent. Also, we see him as the sovereign Lord over history and over every nation as the Redeemer who initiates a covenant relationship with people he has chosen to call his own. Lastly, number five, Exodus emphasizes the how, the what, the why of the nature of true worship that should be our response to his redemptive action. Now, if you were trying to take notes, and I was going too fast, you can get all of this on our, our Facebook page and off the blog, uh, the other blog, the, the Ocean and Dar, uh, .wordpress.net, or .com. So it's, it'll be available there. You can download it, copy it, whatever. Now, as we read together, 
in Exodus this week and into next, as we read together in Exodus this week and into next week, we shall see the shadow of redemption across the pages. The first Passover, the Red Sea crossing, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai are all to the old covenant what Jesus' death, resurrection, and the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost were to the new covenant. So I really hope that you'll be blessed as you read and pray over the book of Exodus in the coming days. But the book opens with a reminder that few things ever stay the same. That change happens. And it happened to the, peop to the Hebrew people. Because for 400 years, 400 years before the events on these pages, one family had survived the famine, came to Egypt seeking relief. Babu Jacob, together with his sons and their wives and children, numbered about 100 people. Fortunately, they had some very high-level connections, Joseph, and were welcomed, but many years have gone by, and their high-level connections have passed into the dimness of history. In fact, the, the text says, uh, a new Pharaoh arose who didn't know Joseph. Relationships had come to an end. It was a lot like Tanzanian culture, where it doesn't matter what matters more than who you are or how much money you have. What really matters is who you know. And suddenly, they didn't know anybody important. And they were in serious trouble. And so over the course of the years, these Hebrews had been incredibly good at reproduction. They were prolific. They had a lot of babies. They were growing rapidly and frightened the Egyptians. They had spread across the entire country. And the Egyptians were frightened of their growth. And so succeeding generations of national leaders had become increasingly alarmed at that growth. And with the result of that was that the, Egypt, the Hebrews lost their freedom. They lost whatever rights they may have had as guests there, and they were forced into slavery. Efforts to quell their population growth finally resulted in Pharaoh ordering a male infanticide. They were going to kill all the boy babies. And that's where we meet the child who became the man who would become the agent of deliverance to his people. And the writer of the first five books of the Bible, Moses, the tribe of Levi. The rules were genocidal. Kill every male child of the Hebrews. And the death crews were searching the communities, the houses, searching for baby boys. And one mother, afraid that someone would hear her crying son and report them, one inventive Hebrew woman named Jochebed prepared a basket, covered it with tar, to waterproof it, hides it in the marsh of Africa's greatest river, the Nile, and puts her daughter on nursery duty, sitting on the bank of the, mar of the marsh, watching the basket, and perhaps throwing rocks at the crocodiles. Watching. And you say, well, what about crocodiles and snakes? Wasn't it dangerous? It was more dangerous to keep that baby in the house. His chances of survival were better to spend at least his days out in the marsh. Because the threat of soldiers spearing and tossing babies in the river without baskets was a greater threat. So she made the choice, put him in the basket, and placed his sister on watch. You know, I don't think they expected the princess to come to that spot in the river for a bath. I really think they expected just to keep him there every day and take him home at night, you know. I, I, I think they weren't... They, they weren't they weren't imagining what might happen. Let me give an example of that. Very rarely do I look at an airplane that I don't think about the Wright brothers. And I, I remember one time sitting at a major airport looking out the window at, at literally hundreds of aircraft, big aircraft, and wondering, did the Wrights think about this? Did they envision this? when they built that first little biplane that flew less than 100 meters? But it flew. Did they dream of this? Was this part of their plan? I share that question with a friend of mine who was a, a very elderly retired engineer who had, who had studied in Montreal, Canada many, many years ago. 
And I was visiting with him, probably it was the last time I ever saw him. I knew it would be the last time I would see him this side of heaven because he wasn't well and he was very, very old. And uh, he asked what I'd been doing and I told him about my travel. And I told him about this question I had about the Wright brothers. And, and uh, he said, no. And he was emphatic. I says, how do you know? He says, I asked them. In 1939, at, a, at the university in Montreal, one of the Wright brothers had been a visiting lecturer in the engineering field. And this man was studying engineering. And it came time for questions and answers. And he raised a question. And at that point, the biggest plane in the world was a DC-3. And he asked them, he said, did you, did you think this would come? Did you see this in the future? Commercial aviation was just beginning. And Orville Wright said, no. We had no idea this would happen. All we wanted to do was be birds. All Jochebed wanted to do was to keep her son away from the soldiers, to help to keep him hidden and safe. And the princess came to take a bath, heard a crying baby out there, and sent her servant out to retrieve the basket, took the baby, said, this must be one of the Hebrew children. The sister comes running, says, can I get you a nurse from our community? They'll come and take care of your baby. And brought Jochebed. And Jochebed was able to nurse Moses until he was weaned, at which time the princess took possession. For the better part of the next 40 years, Moses was a son of privilege, living in the palace while his suffering kinsmen, their situation grew worse and worse. At the age of 40, he attempted an intervention between an Egyptian slave master and a Hebrew slave. And all he succeeded in doing was getting a price put on his head, alienating his own people, and he did successfully run and survive. The prince of Egypt ended up finding work as a sheep herder to a priest named Jethro out of the Midian Desert. Today, in the Midian Desert, in fact, on both sides of the Red Sea coast, there is a community of people called the Bija. British colonials call them the Woolly Woolies because their hair is very, very tightly curled and very soft, and, and it's woolly. The Bija. I have had Bija men, Bija elders, tell me that Jethro was one of them. They believe that. They believe that his daughter, Zipporah, who married Moses, was one of them. They live in the area where Moses fled, and where Moses, for the next 40 years, was a sheep herder. Once rocked to sleep in a waterproof basket on the River Nile, Raised as a prince of Egypt, then many years a desert shepherd living with a nomadic community, this old man perhaps thinks he's seen everything. He comes upon a fire unlike any fire he has ever imagined before. Unlike any fire anyone has ever seen before, because there's this tree, there's a fire within the tree, but the leaves are still green, they're not withering, they're not burning, they're not scorching, the wood is staying firm, and it's unreal, and Moses goes closer to take a look. And we see this story in Exodus 3, starting with verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mount of God. Let me interject here. Horeb is what we also know as Mount Sinai. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush doesn't burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. The amazing thing is, Moses answered. You know, if you tell people you talk to God, they think you're strange. If you, if, if you tell them God talks to you, they think you're crazy. So uh, he hears the voice, Moses calling, and he responds, here am I. Now, as far as we know, it's the first time he ever heard from God. 
We don't know what his mother taught him, but he's been living with pagans. He lived in a pagan situation for nearly 40 years. The voice says, don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now, can you imagine the picture? Here's Moses, who wanted to help his people and got in deep trouble. He's been living with that memory for years. Here's the picture I see. I see an old man running and leaping and shouting, dancing around the camp, around the fire. God has seen. God has heard. God has come. Hallelujah! Yeah. God has heard their cries of pain. God's heard their prayers for help. At last, at long suffering last, God has come down from his home in heaven to where the rubber meets the road. And he's going to fix this mess. And as Moses stops to catch his breath, God goes on in verse 10. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites, out of Egypt. And panic sets in. A rescue by the Lord God would be great. But let me read about it in the newspaper. Let me watch it on CNN. I'm not what you need. No, I... I and a conversation begins starts out in verse 11 by asking the wrong question. Who am I? What am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You know, that's the very question that most of us ask at some point when God calls. Me? <gasps> Who am I? <laughs> you know, and, and it's another way of saying no. No way. It's not going to happen. Not me. I can't do it. Well, we're going to look at Moses' excuses. You see, we tend to use excuses for a variety of reasons. There comes a time when God will grow tired of our excuses, of our attempts to excuse ourselves from obedience to his will. Moses made excuses because he felt inadequate and incompetent for the task of liberating his enslaved people from the Egyptians. Now, it's natural for us to feel insufficient for the jobs that God calls us to do. The greatest damage to the life of the church is done by people who think they can do it in their own strength. If, they think, if I think I'm good enough to do this, if I think I can do this, my friend, I can assure you that I will trip up here on one of these cables and fall flat on my face and do a dive off the platform. I'll trip on my own pride. I'll trip on my own arrogance. But I have to know that it's not me doing it, it's him. It is natural for us to feel insufficient, for us to feel unworthy, for us to feel incapable. But Christ himself stated in Matthew 19, 26, with God all things are possible. We really can't be too hard on old Moses. You know, his ancestors had had multiple encounters with God. They seem to have left no documents. Remember, this is Moses. He's a guy who will later provide us with the documentation. He will write his ancestors' stories. He will take their oral history and put it down in writing. He will provide us with the documentation. He will give us Genesis, this, the book of Exodus, together with Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. 
but he is nearly 400 years removed from the last one of his ancestors who is recorded as having a dynamic verbal relationship with God. He has no mentor. He has no spiritual trainer, no pastor, no spiritual leadership workshops, no MP3s or PDFs, no videos to download from the ocean on YouTube. There's nothing. His emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and physical resources are zero. But God has an answer. Exodus 3.12. God said, I will be with you. And this will be assigned to you, that it's I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Many of us read this passage yesterday. If you didn't, please do read it this afternoon or this evening because we see in it a continuing conversation of argument and rebuttal between God and Moses. I do want us to consider today what Moses was feeling and how he expressed himself and how God responded to him. Throughout the conversation, Moses confessed again and again his own sense of inadequacy, his limited skills, and his fear of rejection Rejection by both his own people and by Pharaoh himself. Moses felt inadequate because he looked at himself, at his own abilities, rather than at God's character. He assumed God was asking him to do it in his own strength. Fifteen centuries later, the Apostle Paul with the equivalent of a PhD in Mosaic literature, would stand on the foundation that Moses laid with the stones of his experience, and he would tell us in 2 Corinthians that he had learned how to overcome his own sense of inadequacy. He wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So now we can stand on the foundation stones laid by Moses, by Paul, and a host of others, knowing that as John the Apostle told us in 1 John 4.4, 4, the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And the Apostle Paul would share with his friends in Philippi and with us, saying, I can do, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. For 40 years, which is longer than many of you have been alive. Yeah. I me. I've been there. I've been married longer than that. But for 40 years, Moses had been largely talking to himself and to his father-in-law's sheep. They didn't talk back. They just went, bah. And he felt unable to communicate effectively to either his own people or with Pharaoh. Many of us don't feel we have sufficient training or experience to do what God wants us to do. The number one fear that most people have, the greatest fear that most people have, is of public speaking. I vividly remember the first time I ever made a public speech. I was 14 years old, standard eight. My teacher had signed me up for a speech contest. We couldn't choose our own subjects. We drew them by lot from a basket. Some of the subjects were more exciting than others. The one I drew was the history of railroads. Now there's one that'll put you to sleep. I did my research and wrote my speech. My teacher sat beside me on the stage as I waited my turn to speak, and she noticed I was sweating. I was terrified. There were hundreds of people in the hall. And she told me there were only three people that I needed to communicate with. Only three people I needed to speak to that night. And I didn't understand what she was saying. But she told me, she says, and, and back in those days, I was called Bobby. Don't you do it. Don't even. She said, Bobby, look around. Look out there. Find three people. 
one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right, who seem to be paying attention. Do it now. If they're awake and active, spot them and note where they're sitting, and then speak to them. Speak to them. Speak to him. And if you will maintain eye contact with those three people back and forth across the room, if you will make sure you hold their attention, you will successfully communicate with everyone in the room. You know that's a lesson that has stuck with me to today. You say, you mean that you're not preaching to me because you're not looking at me? No, I'm preaching to everybody, but I'm trying to maintain eye contact with a few just to make sure that you are staying awake. And if I can keep you awake, everybody else will come along for the ride. Most of them. As a young speaker, it was excellent advice. As I said, I continue to follow it. Except it's sometimes difficult here at the ocean because sometimes it gets real dark out there and I've got those lights in my eyes and I can't see your eyes. So sometimes I just preach in your direction, look in your direction and, and hope that I'm communicating because I can't see you for the lights. Uh, man, I want our own place. Or we can put the lights where we want them. Yeah. Moses said, I have not been eloquent neither recently nor in times past. Later he would refer to his quivering lips. Did he stutter? We don't know. Maybe. You know, there's a few great preachers in history who stuttered and still they successfully pastored and stuttered while they preached. Hard to believe. But God said in Exodus 4.11, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go! I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. You know, some of us need to know that God will give us on-the-job training. The Lord looked at Moses' problem very differently than Moses did. He looks at our problems differently than we do. He has a God perspective. He sees the whole picture. He knows what he can do, what he can add to us and override us, and we become the vehicle through which he moves. In response, the Lord reminded Moses, it was he himself who made him the way he was. Moses did not have to explain to the maker what he was. And neither do you and I. Who better than the Lord could give Moses the ability to express the message of deliverance with clarity, passion, and wisdom? In the course of the conversation, God demonstrated his, his power twice. First, by telling Moses, drop your walking stick. Moses was a shepherd. He has this long stick. And he says, drop your stick on the ground. Boom. And then when the, state, when the stick hits the ground, it becomes a venomous snake. Now, at that point, I exit stage left. But he tells Moses, now pick it up. And Moses, is, Moses obediently reaches down, grabs it by the tail. It becomes a stick again. Now, I can assure you, if that was my stick, it would not stay in the tent tonight. I wouldn't trust it. And then God says, put your hand inside your, your, your shirt. He puts his hand inside his robe, I guess, not shirt, a robe. He puts his hand inside the robe, and he pulls it out, and he's got leprosy. <sighs> Horrible. He says, put it in again. He puts it in again. I'll take it out. He takes it out, and it's clean. Even in the face of those two miracles, Moses still felt intimidated about speaking to his own people or to Pharaoh. The idea of persuading the Hebrew people to follow him or to persuade the Egyptian ruler to release the people was overwhelming. He felt far too weak to lead more than two million people, two million Israelites out of Egypt. The Lord had to remind Moses that it would be by his mighty power that the victory would come, and authorized him to use the walking stick and to use the deal with the hand as persuasive signs to the Hebrew people. Verse 8 of chapter 4 of Exodus. The Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe those two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile. 
pour it on dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses' response was to say, Lord, they won't believe me. They won't do what I tell them. They will just say the Lord never appeared to them. You see, Moses was deeply afraid of failure. Nobody wants to be a loser. Nobody. We love to win. We prize success as a virtue. And we're afraid that somebody else might not recognize our achievements or fail to recognize our accomplishments and may see us as a failure. Even the perception of failure hurts. Moses' final plea to God was to send somebody else. Send a substitute. You know, as I said, I can imagine that fire dance celebrating the presence of God, the realization that God had seen the suffering and heard the cry and felt the pain, and God himself had stepped to earth to bring deliverance. The dance lasted until the music stopped, until the full message penetrated his sunburned skull. The message was, I'm going to send you. Yes, you. And that was when the excuses began. I remember an April morning, some years ago, my prayer time was over. I'd finished my Bible reading for the day. I went and I turned on my radio to listen to BBC News. To hear the news, there had been a plane crash. And immediately after the crash, people on the streets of Kigali started killing each other. And that by that morning, the streets were littered with dead bodies, with the corpses. And in my home on the north slope of Mount Kilimanjaro, the little town of Oloitokitok, I fell on my face before God, and I began to intercede for the nation of Rwanda, and I began to pray, oh God, do something, stop it, help them, God, do something. And I kept praying day after day. I kept following the news, I kept praying, never dreaming that God, that his answer, would include telling Coco and I to go. And then the excuses started. God help them! Send somebody else. I love God. I was actually serving God, but I was comfortable. Now, yes, I lived at the end of 100 kilometers of really bad road. I tore up two Land Rovers in 10 years there. But we were comfortable in the ministry we were involved in. We were safe among the Maasai. And I was asking God for a substitute. And in His grace, He sent a substitute. And then He sent another substitute. But at the same time, He kept saying to us, Go, go. Go, and finally the day came that we loaded everything we could carry into our Land Rover Defender. And we drove the road to Kigali, where for eight years we were part of God's redemptive plan in the nation of Rwanda. And we were part of God's answer to my prayer on that early April morning in 1994. My friend, too many times, too many of us are excusing ourselves from service to God by asking him to send Joe, send Mary, send Jack. Not me. I can't do this. One of the beautiful things in this story is how incredibly patient God was with Moses and with us. But even God is capable of getting angry. God's capable of exasperation. We see that in Exodus 4, uh, 14 and 15. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and said, man, you know, I don't want to get God mad. <laughs> but God's merciful, even when he's angry. God's, answer burned, burned, God's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. 
You know, we have a hard time imagining Moses being comfortable in the Midian Desert. It's hot, it's rocky, it's, it's nasty, it's dry. But comfort is more than a leather-covered reclining chair and clean water, a reliable elect electrical supply, and a flat-screen television. Often the reality of personal comfort centers more upon familiarity and predictability rather than on the physical stuff that we assume it does. God was telling Moses, it's time to leave your comfort zone. It's time for you to become what I have prepared you to be. You see, Moses was comfortable because he knew where you could cross the ravines. He knew where the lions hid. He knew what trails to use and which to avoid. He knew when it would rain, and he knew where to find water. His life was predictable. And his network, his social network in the royal palace, had been left in tatters 40 years before. He had no network among the Hebrews. To the best of our knowledge, his last contact with his own family may have been with his mother handed the freshly weaned little boy to the royal Egyptian mother. That was maybe 77 years before. Nothing about this assignment looked like it would be comfortable. But God said, go. It was too easy. It is too easy to be so comfortable in our own lifestyles that we become unwilling to give up the ease, the convenience, and predictability of our schedules and relinquish control to God. Jesus said in Luke 9.23, and I believe he was dealing partially with our comfort zones, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves And take up their cross and follow me. He clarified that a bit more in Luke 14, 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And I really believe he's talking more about comfort zones than what we have in our pockets. He's talking about moving out of our familiarity. He's talking about moving beyond the next street, beyond the next town, beyond the next village, our speaker this week referred to the 7,000 ethnic groups in the world who have no viable church among them. They do not have an effective witness of the gospel among them. Over 7,000 different people groups. It's incredible. And many are right here in this nation. And it's when but God will perform miracles in and through our lives if we believe him. Zechariah 4, 6, the word of the Lord was, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Actually, it's only when we recognize that we ourselves are weak that God can show himself strong in our lives. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Paul said this. He says, Jesus said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul went on, he says, Therefore I will boast, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. My, my brother and sister, I believe today that God is calling us by His Spirit to identify and to appreciate all the great gifts, abilities, and strengths that He has given to us. Those things that He has intentionally placed in our lives. I want to admonish each one of us to thank God for making us just the way we are. Or stop regretting that we're not like somebody else. You know, at one level, I wish I could sing like Jeffrey.
but I don't hold it against God that he didn't give me that kind of vocal talent. The only powerful gift he really gave me was the gift of gab. I can talk. I can communicate. So I will take the gift he gave me and I will use it to the best of my ability and then allow him to anoint that and take it beyond anything I can do or imagine. But I will not sing. You don't want me to sing. You see, in the power of his spirit, he will make each one of us perfectly capable of doing whatever he wants us to do. He will do for us what he did for Moses and for the Apostle Paul. He will take us beyond our abilities. We must praise God that he is greater than all our problems, all of our excuses, all of our limited understanding. We must get to know God in the marvelous depth of his character and praise him for the fact that all power and authority in heaven and on earth are available to each one of us individually for his high purposes. Not just me. All of us. His power, his gifts are available to all of us for his purpose. When I talk about getting to know him in his character, that's largely the reason that I believe he has led me to lead you in an in-depth passage through the Bible in 2014, that we will know him better. And we must realize our excuses are only valuable to us. My excuses have no significance to God. They only are significant to me. Would you pray with me? Father, at this moment, we're done with excuses. We're done with asking for substitutes. Father, at this moment, we're saying, yes, God, use me. God, you have called out your people and said to go. Even within our own community, go to Splash, go to the nursery, go, go, to, go to the praise team, go to, go, go to the hospitality. Be willing to stand up and preach. You said it. Person after person across this auditorium. And Father, we are done with excuses. And we ask you to put within each one of us the faith, the power to believe that you will take away, you will overwhelm our inabilities, our insecurities, our incompetence, and you will be glorified in us because it will be you who does it in us. We rejoice in that today. Friends, if that's your prayer, would you just hold your open hands out before him right now? Make an offering of you, yourself. You say, God, you know exactly what I am. You know me better than I know myself. You know my inadequacies. You made me. You made my lips. You made my ears. You made my larynx. You made my liver and my spleen. You made my toes and my hands. You made me, and you know me better than I know myself. And if you want to use me, okay, God, I will trust you to do what you think best. And I will be useful to you. Say something like that to him right now. Use us, Father. Help us to put aside our excuses. We will look back on today as a turning point in our lives. When we turned away from fear and we turned towards you. And Father, if there's anybody in this place today, and I'm sure there are, who, who have not yet chosen to follow Jesus, I pray you would give them the courage to do that today. And make a decision to say yes to you. To begin a new life with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Wow. I, I wonder how many of us can identify with Moses today. You feel a little bit like Moses? I've been there, done that, probably still do it. What were the three major excuses that you heard Moses give today? I can't do it. That's the whole thing. I can't do it. And why couldn't he do it? First of all, he did not feel like that what? He didn't feel like he was worthy. I can't do that, not me. Okay, he's unworthy. What was another one? What was the second one he, he said? The people won't do what? They won't listen to me. All right, I can talk, but they won't listen to me. What was the third one he said? I can't speak. If you were to take those three, I'm not worthy. Nobody will listen to me. I can't speak. That's one of our um, <clears throat> takeaways that we'd like for you to work on. Put those three down. Put a number out beside it, one to five, one to 10, whichever one. One says, no, I don't have a problem with that. 10 says, I, I identify very strongly with that. How would you rate? Do you, when God tells you to do something, do you feel unworthy? You say, uh-uh, Lord, not me. Nobody's going to listen to me. I don't know how to talk. Or perhaps those three, you have no problem with those three, but you've got a couple of more that are just you. Write those down, too. And we've, we've said a lot over the last few months about what we believe God wants us to do. And, and I think God has a purpose and a plan for every one of us. And, and I'm hoping that this year will be the year that we all start doing what God wants us to do. So evaluate yourself. And then, as we often do, let's use our community, our expo group, our friends, those we trust that we can pray with and talk to them and, and trust God. But don't let this sermon just stay here in this room when you leave. Take it with you and think about it. Keep reading. Keep praying. Keep believing. And what, was, what did we hear was the solution to those three problems? What solutions did you hear? Trust God. Give me a verse. Philippians, I can do all things. How? Through Christ. Who does what? Strengthens me. That's just one. Bob gave us many more. Go back and look at the sermon. Pick those up. Use them over and over again. Is that all of them? There's one more. Not on there, but on there. Oh, have a wonderful week. God bless you. Mm -hmm.